Perhaps it may be thought somewhat strange how a sermon of that great and good man, Mr. James Guthrie, once Minister of Stirling, should come abroad about 77 years after his death, he having been crowned with martyrdom in the year 1661. I have thought the manner of the conveyance of this sermon to public view at this time of day one of the curious links of the great chain of divine providence. The Reverend Mr. Alexander Hamilton, when he was but a youth at the College of Edinburgh, from a just regard he had to the memory of Mr. Guthrie and the cause in which he suffered, was excited at the peril of his life to take down with his own hand Mr. Guthrie's head from the Netherbow Port of Edinburgh, where it had stood as a public spectacle for about 27 or 28 years. The very same person is ordered 38 years thereafter to succeed him in the ministry and uphold his testimony in the pulpit of Stirling for the space of 12 years. And although a good many ministers, both of the Presbyterian and Episcopal persuasion, had possessed the manse of Stirling since the death of Mr. Guthrie, yet none of them are directed to discover his farewell sermon in Stirling until the same hand is employed which was honored to take down his head and to give it a decent and honorable burial. I make no doubt but the above remark will appear whimsical and contemptible, as well as the sermon itself in the eyes of a generation of men in our day who are wise in their own eyes. But whatever may be the sentiments of men, whose minds the God of this world hath blinded, yet the work of the Lord is honorable and glorious, and will be sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. Whoso is wise and observeth these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. But how awful is the certification to those who shut their eyes and ears against the appearances of God in his providential dispensations. Psalm 28, 5 says, Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operations of his hand, he shall destroy them and not build them up. As some have been longing and crying for the publication of this sermon, so I'm apt to believe that some others will wish that it and the other papers of the worthy author which come along with it had been buried in silence forever. Neither needs this appear strange. His testimony, when alive, tormented the men who then dwelt upon the earth to that degree as to stone this great seer in Israel and afterward to imbrue their hands in his blood. And therefore, it cannot be very easy or pleasant to those who are treading in the same steps by attempting the burial of that cause and work of reformation for which he suffered martyrdom. To hear his voice crying from under the altar or his dying testimony again staring them openly in the face, I make no doubt to say it was the testimony of Jesus for which this faithful martyr, Mr. James Guthrie, suffered. But that testimony was, will partly cast up from the following papers, all of them compiled by him when drawing nigh to eternity. The sermon was preached August 19th, 1660, and he imprisoned the Thursday thereafter. His paper entitled Considerations Anent the Danger of Religion and the Work of Reformation, etc., was published by himself that very same year, The third paper is his speech upon the scaffold the year following. By these and his other papers and contendings contained in Mr. Woodrow's history, he being dead yet speaketh unto the living. And it will be easy for the judicious and serious reader to discern who are in our day bearing up and who are bearing down and burying the cause for which he contended unto blood. Now to the sermon. A sermon preached at Stirling by Mr. James Guthrie on the Sabbath day in the forenoon being the 19th of August, 1660, upon the 22nd verse, 14th chapter of Matthew. He did also read the 23rd and 24th verses of the same chapter, but had not occasion to preach any more, he being imprisoned the Thursday thereafter. The text is Matthew 14th chapter, 22nd, 23rd, 24th verses. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship 
and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. It is of purpose and by choice in reference to the condition and trial of these times we have resolved, through the Lord's assistance, to speak somewhat of this piece of trial and of the storm wherewith the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ were exercised at sea. And the rather we have chosen to speak somewhat of of this word because they were the choice of a very precious and worthy man to speak of in a day of trial. I mean of that eminent servant of God, John Knox, whom the Lord did help to be a most eminent instrument of the work of reformation in the church. We shall not much stand on any particular unfolding of the branches of the text, but take these as they lie in order. The thing we desire you first to look to is how the story that is recorded in these verses is knit these that go before for we will find them knit together by many of the evangelists that is the story of the glorious miracles wrought by Jesus Christ the Lord in feeding so many thousands of people with a few loaves and a, and a few little fishes after this that sad trial which the disciples met with at sea they are knit together by the evangelist Matthew, Mark, and John. After that, the Lord Jesus Christ had preached to the people and his disciples and had fed many thousands with a few loaves and a few fishes and had manifested much of his power and glory. He constrains his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. He sends his disciples to the sea and the multitude away that they They should not for a season hear any more of his doctrine and see any more of his miracles. That we may lay a foundation for somewhat for your edification. First, it may be inquired, why is it that he sends away both his disciples and the multitude at that time and would have an interruption of his doctrine and miracles when he sends his disciples to the sea and the multitude to their own home? If we look to the other evangelists, we will find the causes there enough. Mark 6.52, the cause is given there. Why he thus exercised his disciples. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. Albeit the Lord Jesus Christ had revealed much of his power and glory in the miracle of the loaves, yet his disciples did not duly consider thereof. Therefore, he would needs exercise them with a storm and a tempest at sea, that they might be both taught in the knowledge of their own weakness and also might be better schooled in the faith of his power and glory. The reason why he sent the multitude away is set down in the gospel written by John, chapter 6, 26. When the multitude comes again, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. Compare it with that in the 15th verse, when Jesus Christ therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain, himself alone. He knew that for all that they had seen and heard of his word and miracles, they were of a very carnal disposition and seeking to establish them to themselves carnal prosperity and peace. Therefore, he sent them away for a time. From the connection of these two histories and from the scope of the whole, we offer you one point of doctrine. That the Lord Jesus Christ is oft times and ordinarily pleased after special manifestations of his power and glory in his church and amongst his people to exercise them with special pieces of trial and troubles and storms. After his doing of great work for their comfort, he is ordinarily pleased to raise great and dreadful storms and tempests for their exercise and trial. So here, when he hath um, in a most comfortable and kindly way banqueted them and revealed much of his power and love in so doing, he sends them a storm and a tempest on the back of it and will have an interruption of his doctrine and miracles for a time wherein they are all like to be drowned. 
There are many instances in the word of the Lord's dealing with us. Look in the books of Moses what follows on the back of that glorious deliverance that the Lord gave to the people of Israel out of Egypt. They are exercised 40 years in the wilderness in which they had many a sad day ere they entered the land of Canaan. The like we may see in the church of Israel in 1 Samuel. The Lord gave a great deliverance from the Philistines by the ministry of his servant Samuel. And a glorious, blessed work of reformation there was. But all that was again destroyed by the hand of Saul. And persecution raised against the church of God. A third instance you will find if you will read the history of the reign of Hezekiah and Manasseh, kings of Judah. As it is recorded in the second book of Chronicles, there was a great reformation in the days of Hezekiah. A covenant sworn by the king, princes, priests, and the whole body of the land. All corruption cast out. The pure worship and ordinances of God set up. There was a dreadful trial by the hand of Sennacherib. So scarcely was Hezekiah well in his grave. Till Manasseh succeeds in his room and brings in corruption and persecution both at once. A fourth instance was in the days of Josiah. How much of the power and glory of the Lord is manifested. But how sad a trial comes on the back of it that the church seems to be wholly defaced by the king of Babylon. Fifth instance we will find after the return of Israel out of Babylon in the fourth of Ezra. The foundation of the Lord's house is laid, but in a little while the work is interrupted till the second year of Darius the king by the derision and enmity of wicked men. A like instance you shall also find in the New Testament. Look what a length our blessed Lord brought the work of the gospel. But what follows in the 16th of John, 31 and 32nd verses? Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And he is crucified and laid in his grave, and a stone laid on the grave's mouth, and little appearance that ever there should have been more mention of him in the land of the living. Then look another instance in the days of the apostles, in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth chapters of the Acts. What a blessed reformation there was. But in the close of the sixth chapter and in the beginning of the eighth, you see what a sad interruption and scattering is in the church and a great persecution raised against it. And as there are many instances in the words, so there are many instances in the story of the church. Many great things were done by the apostles, and a glorious reformation there was in, br- in the bringing in of the Gentiles. But how dreadful a persecution ra- is raised through all the world. And there is a notable instance when the Lord began to reform the church from the darkness of popery by that worthy instrument, Luther, But shortly after, did not Charles V raise a cruel war against all the princes of Germany and raised cruel edicts against all that clave to the church? And also in the days of King Edward VI, that good prince, what a glorious work was in England. But a few years after that, godly prince died. Queen Mary succeeds, bringing and brings in popery and raises a bitter persecution against the saints of God. And we cannot be so great strangers to your own condition at home, how sad an interruption in the work of Reformation met with from the prelates not long ago. So that there is nothing more ordinary in the church than after the Lord has communicated himself in a special way, in his power and glory, than to exercise them with sad storms and tempests on the back of it. Concerning this dispensation, we would first inquire a little into the grounds and reasons of it, why the Lord sees it fit to do so. Next, into the kinds of it, or in what several ways it is that he sees fit to do so. For the reasons, grounds, and causes of it, we shall not speak of many, though many might be spoken of, but shortly touch some of the most common and obvious. First, the Lord makes such a changing of his dealing with his church for the chastising of their sin and correcting of their iniquity a people to whom he manifests himself in his power and glory, mercy and truth, do not always behave themselves as they ought to. But even while he is dealing kindly with them, they do many ways 
provoke him to wrath. Therefore, God, for correcting their sin and chastising their iniquity, brings troubles and storms upon them. In the 99th Psalm, the Lord is brought to take vengeance on the inventions of his people in the wilderness. That you may understand this a better, look at the 78th Psalm, which is a clear commentary to this, where his rod, where he hath punished that people in the wilderness and delayed their entrance into Canaan, and their sin both are set down. Their unsteadfastness in the Lord's covenant. You may look some of the proofs of these sins. First, in the 10th and 11th verses of Psalm 78, they kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and wonders that he had showed them. They were unsteadfast in the Lord's covenant in the 19th and 20th chapter of Exodus. They entered in a most solemn covenant with God that all of them understood to stand to and to prove faithful therein. But they kept not his covenant, but dealt deceitfully in it. Therefore he brought such storms on them in the wilderness, and so long suspended their entrance into the promised land. A second sin is in the 18th verse, they sinned yet more and tempted him in their hearts by asking meat for their lusts. They are not satisfied with the things that God has allowed them, but lusted after strange things and became lustful in their appetites. Therefore God is wroth, and thus exerciseth them in the wilderness. A third sin is in the 22nd verse, their diffidence and unbelief. They believed not God and trusted not in his salvation. They put tempting questions concerning his power and goodness in the 19th verse. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Therefore he thus exercised them with storms. The fourth sin is they despised and undervalued the precious manna which God sent down from heaven for feeding of them. Numbers 21.5 Our souls loathed this light bread. A fifth sin is their murmuring, grudging, and repining against God. A sixth sin is their complaint of coming out of Egypt, their rebelling and speaking of a captain to return back again. The last sin is their corrupting the worship of God and making a golden calf. And because of these sins, the Lord is angry and correcteth and chastises them 40 years long in the wilderness. A second reason is the Lord's bringing sad storms on the back of glorious manifestations of himself and his word and works is for purging of his people. As he will correct them and have them to know the bitterness of their sin, so he will have them to be purged of it. There is a sad trial in the 11th chapter of Daniel, and this is given as the reason of it to purge, to try, and to make white. In the 35th verse, And some of them understanding shall fall, to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. There is in the church and people of God much dross. Therefore he sees it necessary they be put to the fire, purging away of their dross. A third reason where the Lord brings Bad, sad storms on the back of glorious manifestations of himself is for divor- discovering and bringing forth the hypocrites and such as are unsound. Daniel 11:34. Many cleave to the Lord's people by flattery, especially it's so when the Lord is eminently appearing and revealing himself gloriously in his word and works. Many then undertake a profession in whose hearts there is no sincerity and truth. Many then cleave to the cause and work of God by flattery, which his soul cannot endure. Therefore, he brings a winnowing fan and lets them up before the wind, that he may know who is chaff and who is corn. Psalm 125, 4 and 5. He doth good to those that are upright in heart. But as for such as turn aside to crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. Therefore, for discovery of which he sends sad storms on the back of Reformation. Another reason of the Lord's bringing sad storms and tempests on his people on the back of glorious manifestations of himself is that he may prove and take a trial of the integrity, faith, and patience of his saints and in trying of them to purchase glory to himself and a name to them. 1 Peter 1, 7 that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. There is also a reason concerning adversaries, which we shall not now meddle with. But we come to the second point, how it is, or in what several sorts of ways it is, that the Lord is pleased thus to dispense. I mean, to send storms and trials on his servants and people, immediately on the back of some glorious appearance and notable works of kindness and mercy amongst them. There might be a great many ways named how the Lord is pleased to do thus. We shall name only four generals. First, he does it sometime by interrupting of his work. Thus he did at the place cited before in Ezra 4. After the foundation of the Lord's house is laid, a company of malignant men, enemies to the poor people of God and his work, who are exceeding ill-satisfied that the work of God should prosper. They come by all means to interrupt the work of God, and when they could not prevail by flattery, they go to the king of Persia and load the people of God with false aspersions that they were about to rebel, by which suggestions they obtain letters from the king commanding them to cease building of the temple. And when the copy of the king's letters was read, they made them to cease by force and power. A second way is by corruption, when he suffers evil instruments not only to make an inst- interruption, but to make a corruption, so to speak, and to mingle these with the purity of his ordinances and worship. God raises up ill instruments to make people lick up the vomit of these corruptions, which have been formerly cast out. There had been a blessed reformation in the days of Hezekiah, and all corruption cast out, but all that corruption is brought in again in the days of Manasseh, and more and worse than ever had been before. A third way is by destruction so to speak, not only when the work of God is interrupted and corrupted, but when it is destroyed and taken away. There is in the days of Zedekiah a total destroying of the temple and all the work. Fourth way is by persecution to these that cleave to the truth and work of God. Thus it was in the days of the apostles, Acts 5, they fall on the ministers of the Lord's house and slay some of them with the sword and put others in prison so that they could not preach the word in Jerusalem. Some one or all of these ways, the Lord sets on foot such dispensations. We would now speak somewhat of the use we would take, we would make of it, and first it says this to us, that we of this church and nation would be looking for a storm. The Lord hath been graciously pleased to make glorious discoveries of his power and mercy in his word and works amongst us. Now these many years, and even on that account, we would be looking for a storm and we shall give you these few reasons wherefore we, wish we would look for it. First reason, because as I told you, it's ordinary with God in his dispensations to his people to knit these two together with great manifestations of his mercy to bring troubles, tempests, and trials, as you will find frequently in the word. A second reason wherefore we would look for a storm is because we are guilty of the sins that bring on storms on the church and the people of God. We have told you what storms came on Israel in the wilderness after their coming out of Egypt. And we have told you their sin that brought them on. Unsteadfastness in the Lord's covenant. Murmuring against God. Tempting of God. Diffidence and unbelief. Despising and loathing of the precious manna. Their rebelling against God. The corrupting of the worship and ordinances of God, etc. See if we be not guilty of all these sins. Have we not been unsteadfast in the covenant? Is not the obligation thereof in great measure forgotten? And who has remembered to perform his vow unto the Lord almost in anything, either in the national or solemn league and covenant? Are we not guilty of lusting and not satisfied with the things that God hath given us? But the heart is carried away with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Are we not guilty of repining against God? Are we not guilty of despising and loathing the precious manna of the gospel? Are we not guilty of misbelief and tempting of God? Are we not guilty of corrupting of the ordinances of God and spoiling many of his precious truths? And are there not many speaking of making a captain to return again to Egypt and to involve themselves in the bondage of all these corruptions which have 
been formally cast out and engaged against in the covenant. And if for these things God brought storms on them, how shall we avoid them? A third thing that says there is a storm coming is because these amongst whom he doth eminently manifest himself, he doth also eminently try them, that he may bring forth their faith and patience. We have had trials, but none of us have have resisted unto blood. They have been but fresh water trials. The trials are not answerable to these eminent dispensations enjoyed. We have but run with the footmen and have not yet contended with the horsemen. We have not yet swimmed in the swellings of Jordan. Jeremiah 12.5 A fourth thing that says there is a storm coming is because there is among us a huge multitude of hollow-hearted men joined in the covenant with treacherous hearts. The Lord hath brought forth many of these already, but it is likely there will be more visible discoveries that will make men disown and disavow the covenant of God. Another thing that says you would look for a storm is because that has already begun. The wind of the Lord's fan has already begun to blow. Several who were eminent in the work of the Lord are imprisoned. Several ambassadors of the Lord's house cast out. And doth not this say that there is a storm coming? And lastly, this says that he would look for a storm because all the wicked and these that have been enemies to the people of God are already lifting up the head. And that is... I, the prognostic of a storm. The second use is, as we would look for a storm, so we would not stumble at it when it comes, because it is the work of our God. It's the ordinary path road that the Lord uses to take or give in his dispensations to his church. There are several sorts of stumbling that folk fall in when the Lord is pleased to bring storms on his church and people. All of them we would be aware of. First, the stumbling of the children of Israel that we read of when the storms were like to rise. They stumble so far as to speak of quitting of the Lord, work of the Lord and not marching on further to take possession of the promised land. And they speak of making a captain to return back again to Egypt. We would fear that that shall be the stumbling of many in these times, that they shall take a resolution to quit all the work of God and the work of reformation and be content to be carried back again to these corruptions from whence they were by the mercy of God delivered. That is a most dreadful stumbling. We warn you of it and we beseech you in the name of the Lord to take heed to it. Second sort of stumbling that we would be aware of is the stumbling of Doeg the Edomite, Second Samuel 22. When a storm was like to arise upon the church and the people of God, he stumbled so far at these things as he falls to be an accuser of those who had been employed in the work of God and walked in their integrity. To accuse honest, holy David. And from an accuser came to be an open persecutor of the people of God. We would take heed that for currying of favor to ourselves, we be not accusers of others. This is the way of many in these nations They know no other way of currying a favor to themselves but by becoming accusers of the saints of God. Look to it, for in a while you will turn open persecutors. When none would fall on the priests of the Lord, Doeg the Edomite, ere he lost favor he had gotten, would fall on them. A third sort of stumbling that we would be aware of is the stumbling of Shebna, the treasurer, scribe, Isaiah 22. When Sennacherib invaded Judah, though he pretended friendship, yet he, in a secret way, complied with Sennacherib. And so far as lay in him, supplanted good King Hezekiah and the people of God. We would take heed of that. Another sort of stumbling that we would be aware of is that stumbling of Demas, 2 Timothy 4.10, who, when a storm arises, he thought it meet to shift for himself and embrace this present world. Demas has forsaken us, says Paul, having loved this present world and has departed unto Thessalonica. Look, we pray you in this place to that that is most like to be your temptation, the lust of the things of the world. He will prove steadfast in the cause that ye have owned, and therefore ye would study to have our hearts loosed from these things that will make you stumble in a stormy day. 
Another sort of stumbling that we would be aware of is the stumbling of Baruch, Jeremiah 45, 3. When he and Jeremiah were like to be put to death for the cause that they were engaged unto, he fainted and was afraid. Woe is me, says he, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing and I find no rest. We would take heed that we faint not, neither be of a fearful heart. Own the cause of God and interest of Jesus Christ. Yea, that carnal fear carries Peter so far as to deny his Lord and Master. We would beware of the stumbling of Judas, who, when he got not the thing that he would have been at by following of Jesus Christ, he resolves to betray his Master. Look, that disappointments in following the cause of Christ make you not turn treacherous unto it. And lastly, we would have you beware of the stumbling of the men of Judah, Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah would have had them staying in the land of Judah, and they would not, but would go down to the land of Egypt. And they tell him, It was better with us, say they, when we were when we burnt incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her. For then we had plenty of victuals, and we were well, saw no evil. We would take heed that nothing make us to call in question the cause of God that we have been engaged unto. A third use, if it be so, the tempests and storms are like to blow, then we would be careful to prepare for them. A few things we would name that we would look for preparing of us. First, we would study to have our ship as light of all unnecessary burdens as we can. I mean all things of the present world, all things besides God and our precious soul. We would have as little weight of these things on our spirits as we may for they will sink our ship in a storm. Secondly, we would be careful to make friendship with Jesus Christ, that blessed pilot, that we may get him in the ship with us, for we are not able to steer our ship in a storm. Thirdly, we would be careful to keep a low sail, to have our spirits humble and low before the Lord, for the humble soul is most like to hold out when the wind and storm blows. Fourthly, we would be careful to get the knowledge of the cause that we profess, for indeed, a dark night is ill to fail in, when the wind blows and when there are quicksands before us. And lastly, we would be careful to have our ship well ballasted with the faith and patience of the saints. The fourth use, we would consider what grounds of consolation we shall have for strengthening of our hearts if we bide fast by the cause of Jesus Christ for the biding out of a storm. If so be, God be pleased to bring it upon us. We might name many, only at this time take these few. The first ground of encouragement is that you have a good cause. I mean the cause of God and the interest of Jesus Christ. Speak against it who will, forsake it who will, reproach and persecute it who will. Doubtless good is the cause. The cause is worth the contending for, worth the suffering, anything that can come for it. Secondly, another thing to be a ground of comfort to us is as we have a good cause, so we have a good captain too. Jesus Christ, the Lord, who is the captain and prince of salvation, who was never put to the worst, and who sits at the right hand of the Father and will reign there till he make all his enemies his footstool. Thirdly, another thing to be a ground of consolation to us is that we have a good cause a good captain, so we have good company too. All in whose hearts the fear of the Lord is in these three nations. Yea, more, we have all the saints that have lived since the beginning of the world for all the cause they have owned and suffered for is one and the same. Though there be a sundry branches of it, we all have also the blessed promises of God. And we have the experience of all the saints. We also have our own experiences and many things more of that kind. Oh, that we knew our privileges for the strengthening of our hearts to be sincere and steadfast in his work. And so we close.